Welcome, everybody. This is an exciting uh, Lunch and Learn. I hope you really like this. There, there's a lot of thought that actually kind of goes into this thing, so I hope you kind of follow along with it very closely. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, and then we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. So here it is. And so everybody can see my screen okay and see that? All right, so let me get this. So what's this topic? So the title for this topic is, is um, Sarah just explained, I'm, I'm gonna clarify a little bit further. And we're gonna talk about how many times the question that you can ask is really the answer to things, right? And so what, is, what does that really mean? Well, first off, introduction wise, I'd like to introduce my team and uh, we have this information for you, of course, but uh, we we uh, been in business for over 16 years. We're a small woman owned business located out of Stuart, Florida. Um, we work with many different industries globally on the development of human factored procedures and work instructions. And that's what we specialize in. And so uh, as compared to just technical writing, this is something that was created in the commercial nuclear power industry about 20 years ago. It's been very effective and eliminating human performance errors and really raising the bar up on procedures. And so as a company, we either write procedures, we have money uh, from scratch, or we have many procedures that we update for our customers, eliminate the human performance errors, uh, new projects for con new construction, LNG plants, and so on and so forth around the globe. And so that, that's kind of about all the introduction, because I really want to jump right into a material. So that's a little bit about us. And right here is the uh, the problem statement. So as a company, uh, we have human factored literally thousands of procedures in over the last 16 years. Now, this process involves analyzing the cognitive and the physical aspects of human performance uh, concerning the task, and then designing a procedure that really optimizes the human performance using a, a, a standard that was, like I said, was developed in the commercial nuclear power industry that's owned by today, the Procedure Professionals Association. And um, they have a website, it's uh, www.ppaweb.org, org, and um, the number, as you can see, is that PPA 90705 is like the standard that we use for developing these procedures over all these years. Um, our services initially started in the commercial nuclear power industry, although um, they reach almost all today, we almost reach to all high risk uh, industries globally. Um, our focus supports our customers with instructions, consulting, uh, raising awareness of the importance of developing procedures, instructions with a human performance improvement focus, in addition to the typical safety and technical adequacy that you would expect uh, in these very, really, vitally important documents, right? Now, Now, as, as we have evolved as a business and matured in our understanding of what it takes to develop human factor procedures, we continually see repeat challenges, especially in the areas where about vague steps or steps that are missing critical detail. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, oh, hit the wrong button there, sorry about that. Here it comes, why? Why are we continuing to see this? I mean, of course, it's a constant stream of work for us and, and the staff that we have here at PSM. But why do we constantly see these challenges in the documents that we receive from our customers? So today's Lunch and Learn will focus on the question. On, on the question. Uh, often the right question asked is the answer to the problem. Um, how can a lack of a questioning attitude affect the successful outcomes in developing procedures and instructions. Here's an example. So here is one page from just a procedure that we worked on here recently. And out in the margin is all the questions that was posed by our staff that focused to the subject matter experts of the client that this document was their support. And this was in the refining industry, right? And so this document was like 30 some pages long and every single page had just about this volume of questions to it. 
Now, again, we cleaned the document up tremendously. So we eliminated all the existing human performance challenges. Sometimes we have questions as, you know, as you eliminate the human performance challenges, we do our utmost to try not to impact the technical guidance there. So we challenge it technically. Sometimes it's really gray, though. It's really close to where the challenges that we that we corrected or maybe or potentially impacting the technical content. And then we'll raise that up as a question to the subject matter expert. But in many cases, some of the guidance that's in these documents are extremely vague. And one of the error traps that we look for is vague guidance or, or vague, vague guidance, right? So we'll look for that. And we'll raise that up to the subject matter expert to say, hey, look, you know, you basically have a step here that says stop the pump before the level gets too high. We would normally put what the level is. And so we would look at that as being vague. And we need more detail here based on what the standards are today. Now, why... Why are questions important? And what I like to do is kind of look at this a little bit from a leadership perspective. So John Maxwell is one of the most notable uh, experts in, in uh, leadership development. Uh, I'm a certified John Maxwell leadership coach and uh, just did that recently. And so he has a book and then one of the books that he, he wrote, which he's got over 90 million books sold, I think, in the book, it's called Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. And he asks, so why are questions so important? And he notes the more questions, he, and he notes in his book, he says, the more questions I ask, the more valuable I recognize them to be. He continues, if you want to be successful and reach your leadership potential, you must embrace questions as a lifestyle. So he says here why. One, uh, you only get the answers to the questions you ask. Questions unlock and open the doors that otherwise remain closed. Questions are our most effective means of connecting with people. Questions uh, cultivate humility. Uh, questions help engage others in conversation. They allow us to build better ideas, uh, give us a different perspective, uh, challenge mindsets, and get us out of ruts is one of the things he says in here. Now, Within his book, he has a quote from Bob Beale, and 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 Bob Beale's book it's called "Asking Profound Question." He writes, "There's a gigantic difference between the person who has no questions to help him or her process situations and the person who has profound questions available." Here are a few of the differences. You know, without a profound question, we can say you get shallow answers. With profound questions, you get profound answers. Sometimes uh, the uh, without profound questions, you go shows a lack of confidence versus uh, life confidence, poor decision making, um, live in a mental fog, and so on. So you can see between the two columns, there's a kind of a, a substantial shift there between not asking questions and then asking questions, and the way you're going to get the results back from that, right? Now, IBM founder Thomas J. Watson said, the ability to ask the right question is more than half the battle of finding the answer. This is only true, of course, if you're willing to ask the question. Management expert Peter Ducker said, my greatest strength as a consultant is to be ignorant and ask a few questions. So successful leaders relentlessly ask questions and have an incurable desire to pick the brains of the people they meet. Now, John Maxwell continues on that makes the following points. He says, as a leader, you must always be looking for forward, looking forward for the sake of your team. When you face a problem, you don't know what steps need to be taken to advance the team, you should ask the following questions. Why do we have this problem? How do we solve this problem? What specific steps must be taken to solve the problem? Now, Maxwell continues in his book to say, you know, questions are the most effective means of connecting people. Before we can communicate, we must establish commonality. 
the greater the commonality, the greater the potential for connection and communication to flow back and forth, right? So the goal of effective communication is to prompt people to think, me too. Too many speakers today you'll see um, seem to elicit the thought, so what, right? The most effective way to connect with others is by asking questions. Now, George Bernard Shaw, who was a Nobel Prize winning uh, literature uh, writer, right, uh, wrote the following. It says, you know, the greatest problem with communication is the illusion that has been accomplished. So many times we talk to one another and we kind of talk and we go into the conversation uh, with the idea that I'm talking at you versus talking with you. And because I'm talking at you, you naturally get it. Instead of talking with you to try to meet, to try to ensure that we have a common understanding of what the communication is between the two of us, right? Now, additionally, Maxwell basically continues and says, hey, questions give us a different perspective. Too often as leaders, we get fixated on our own point of view and spend time trying to convince others of our opinions instead of trying to find out theirs. The true, this, the true spirit of conversation consists in building on another man's observation, not overturning it. Now, by asking questions and listening carefully to the answers, we can discover valuable perspectives other than our own. That valuable, that's valuable because we often make faulty assumptions about other people. For example, many times we believe people are good at the same things we're good at. They aren't. Many times we believe people are energized by the same things that energize us. They aren't. We believe people see the big picture in the same way we do. They don't. Before you attempt to set things right, you need to make sure you see things right. Miscommunication results from people's different assumptions. By asking questions, we can correct those wrong assumptions and prevent the miscommunication. State, statement, statesman and philanthropist Bernard Brosh said, millions saw the apple fall, but Newton was the only one who asked why. Because Newton took time to ask questions, the world benefited from his theory on gravitativity. Maxwell further wrote, it says, though many of us try to make ourselves look smart by giving clear answers, we would be better off if we focused our attention on asking questions. If we ask good questions of the right people, we'll have a wonderful return for our lives. Never forget, good questions inform. Great questions are transfer transform. Great, great questions transform. Now, I'm going to talk a little nuclear here in the commercial nuclear power industry for a minute, right? So back in 2004, this agency that was created after the accident at Three Mile Island, it's called EMPO, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. EMPO has been tasked with monitoring the performance of all the nukes in this country and actually kind of do it worldwide, of course. And so in doing this, they inspect every commercial nuclear power plant in this country um, once every two years for two weeks. And so they published many documents, many um, industry, excuse me, industry guidelines and standards and industry best practice documents. And back in 2004, they developed a document that was called the Principles of Strong Nuclear Safety Culture. Now, in the forward area of that document, it states the following. It says, principles for a strong nuclear safety culture describes the essential attributes of a healthy nuclear safety culture, hereafter described as safety culture. Now, with the goal of creating a framework for open discussion and continuing evolution of safety culture throughout the commercial nuclear energy generating industry, the principles and associated attributes described have a strong basis in plan events. Now, 
this was in the document and this is the principles that are discussed and i want to focus on number six number six talks about a questioning attitude to cult is cultivated right now look at this now what number six says is the industry guidance provided right of that list number six is called a questioning attitude is cultivated right now in that area it discusses it says individuals demonstrate a questioning attitude and here are the key points by challenging assumptions investigating anomalies and considering potential adverse consequences of planned actions now this attitude is shaped by an understanding that accidents often result from a series of decisions and actions that reflect flaws in shared assumptions, values, and beliefs of the organization. We thought it was good, but it was bad anyway, right? Now, all employees are watchful for conditions or activities that can have an undesirable effect on plant safety. Additionally, while individuals expect su successful outcomes of daily activities, they recognize the possibility of mistakes and worst case scenarios. Contingencies are developed to deal with these possibilities. Anomalies are recognized, thoroughly investigated, promptly mitigated, and periodically analyzed in the aggregate. Personnel do not proceed in the face of uncertainty. Now, workers identify conditions or behaviors that have a potential to degrade operating or design margins. Such circumstances are promptly identified and resolved. Employees understand that complex technologies can fail in unexpected ways. They are aware of latent problems and make conservative decisions based on their potential. Groupthink is avoided through the diversity of thought and intellectual curiosity, opposing views are encouraged and considered. Now, pause here for a second and think about those things we just talked about, right? Of course, I get this setting on my uh, my slides for this is doing this back and forth thing, so I apologize for that. So if you look at this, there are some extremely key points here. And when I think about the procedures that we review, remember what I tell you, vague guidance, right? Or, or where we're missing critical details. That's the two key points that kind of spurn this launch and learn today, right? What I do not see is I don't see us in the different industry modeling these questions, right? If you think about this questioning attitude, and challenging assumptions and investigating anomalies, right? Or if you look at the steps and the steps talk about slowly opening this or quickly doing this or stop the pump before the level gets too high or, or you know, add the desired amount of chemicals to this thing, all those type of vague statements can make sense to someone who has 20, 30 years of experience. But we don't write procedures instructions for someone that has that level of maturity in their experience and proficiency. We're writing them for the person who is qualified, although inexperienced, right? And there's a big difference there, sometimes two, three, or four decades of experience difference in the people. But we all have to go home at the end of the day. That is our goal. That is our marching orders here at PSM. Our objective is to make sure that everyone goes home at the end of the day. So asking these types of questions, it's really interesting because I see it more prominent in the commercial nuclear industry than I do in other industries. But even I've seen this slip in the commercial nukes in the last so many years, right? Now, it's, I think it's important to go back and say that we, we look for these things and we need to be conscious of this, that we just don't accept that, well, you know, Sarah's going to know this or you're going to know this. We need to ask that question and say, well, and ask the question to Sarah. Sarah, what do you think about this? Yeah, I don't, I've never had that 
issue come up before, Steve? I don't know. Um, I have to think about that a little bit. And so, okay, well, this is exactly where I'm going. I mean, I was hoping that you have an answer like this, you know, come up there. So we need to make sure we provide that extra detail in the procedure to make sure that everybody can come up with that. And we're not in the field or out in the areas and we're trying to make a decision at that point as we try to go along, right? So let me get back to where I was here. Now it's interesting because if you look at this other document, so that document was written in 2004, right? Now in January of 2013, right? Impo released this document that was actually called, um, I got the number on it here. It was actually 2012 was when it was actually titled, but it was released in 2013. And it's interesting because this document was called the traits of a healthy nuclear safety culture, very similar to what it was in 2004. And yet again, here they have individual commitment to safety, questioning attitude. And then we're going to talk about this respectful work environment also, right? But look at this, uh, look at this document for a second. So when MPO 12012 was, was um, published in here, one of the questioning attitude criteria in there was is that individuals avoid complacency and continuously challenge existing conditions, assumptions, anomalies, and activities in order to identify discrepancies that might result in error or inappropriate action. So you notice it's got the same kind of flavor as it did in 2004, but they're a little bit more specific on where they're targeting here, right? All employees are watchful of assumptions, values, conditions, or activities that can have an undesirable effect on plant safety. Now, attributes. Nuclear is recognized as a special and unique. Individuals understand that complex technologies can fail in unpredictable ways. Well, you can take the nuclear right out of that discussion. That doesn't just, I mean, nuclear does not have the corner on this, on these issues. This applies in all industry, especially where there's critical tasks performed that can result in equipment damage and personal injury in particular, right? We need to challenge the unknown. Individuals stop when faced with uncertain condition. Risks are evaluated and managed before work proceeds, right? We need to challenge assumptions. Just because it was an engineering document and came from engineering and said, oh, you know, engineering signed off on this. It has all the approvals. I, I must be looking at this wrong. No. It's amazing how sometimes a procedure writer or a work planner can find something that's been in the document for three or four years, used multiple times, just to find out that a different look at it, looking at through a different set of lenses, different question can pop up and you'll question that and says, you know, that's not right, right? We, so we got to challenge assumptions, right? And um, make sure that individuals challenge and offer opposing views when they believe something's not correct. You want to avoid complacency. Individuals recognize and plan for the possibilities of mistakes, latent issues, inherent risk, even while expecting successful outcomes. Now, it's interesting because one of the other criteria in this MPO 12012 document was this title called Respectful Work Environment, right? And so it's really interesting because there was, as Sarah put in a lot of the, um, the blogs that we sent out or the, uh, the um, LinkedIn blast for, you know, discussing and advertising for this, we talked about in there about how people sometimes don't feel comfortable in raising questions, right? They're like, oh, if someone's going to think I'm stupid or, you know, or I don't want to come across like I don't know my job and, you know, I'm going to be embarrassed, you know, with this. And you have to get over all that, right? And so notice in here under this respectful work environment, which is part of the list of things that they were talking about, how... The number two on that list says that opinions are valued. Individuals are encouraged to voice their concerns, provide suggestions, and raise questions. Differing opinions are respected. 
with that. And so this all ties back. Remember, here it is, raising questions and you know making sure that there's respect involved. Okay. So notice on on this slide how I struck the word nuclear up here in the title, right? Given our global involvement in several industries today, the safety culture items on the previous slides focus on communications and respect, and were not nuclear centric in the least bit, even though they were documents generated from the commercial nuclear power industry, right? Now, John Maxwell and the other notable quotations focused on questions and the questioning attitude as a key to success in anything that we do, right? In consideration that procedures and instructions are the number one human performance tool used to influence work performance without error, that comes another from another info document, their success from our observations is continually impacted by a lack of a good questioning attitude. Now, and we get into what we think more like when you talk about questioning attitude, another parallel to this is kind of looking at critical thinking, right? Now, there was an article written by a couple of educational psychologists, Linda Elder and Richard Paul. And in this article that they wrote, it was titled How to Think Effectively Then Six Stages of Critical Thinking. Um, they make the following points. So I only went through the pieces on here that were the key points I want to discuss with you today. One of the things that they both stated in their in their article is, is to develop as a critical thinker. Using your mind more effectively is not automatic. It is unlikely to take place subconsciously. In other words, you have to put in the work, keep doing it, or you lose that faculty. Now, what do I mean by this? Having a questioning attitude is something that you have to practice. And the practice, the only way to practice is to practice without the fear of someone thinking that you're asking stupid questions, right? The only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. That's typically the one that causes the accident in the first place. And so what they're trying to say is, is that this questioning thing, just like the, the talents that you have and the jobs that many of you have, your talent and your proficiency expand over time. You're not a perfect question asker right at time zero. This is something that has to be practiced, something that you have to look. Sometimes asking questions solicit a good conversation with a group of people, and you'll hear other questions asked. And I don't know how many of you have had that happen to you where you've been in a, a group of people and you ask a question that maybe kind of starts the conversation going around the table. And listening to others people, other people's thoughts really are things that you kind of ingrain in your head through your experience now. You say, wow, you know, Sarah really asked a great question with that. I can remember that for the future. And so what I'm trying to get at is, you know, having that questioning attitude and exercising it causes you to grow in your ability to think more broadly and have better questions and come up with better answers, right? Now, we must teach in, in such a way that students can, this is again from um, uh, from Linda Elder and Richard Paul in, in the article they write, they say, you know, we must teach in such a way that students come to understand the power and knowing that whenever humans reason, they have no choice but to use certain predictable structures in their thought. That thinking is inevitably driven by questions. So think about that, right? So when someone raises the question, that's when the thought process kicks off. Let's say, well, you know, that's a really great question. Hadn't really thought about that, you know? I mean, I guess my perspective on it would be this, or I guess the way I would look at it, and then what happens is, you know, there's like, well, and then someone, have you had this happen to you? Will someone come up and say, well, well, but then, Steve, I, I, I see where you're coming from, but what about this? Oh, okay. Now that's that's even a better question yet, right? Now, I'm not sure what to think about that. And then what happens, it, it kind of evolves, right? Um, notice they also say that we seek answers to questions for some purpose, that to answer questions, we need information. 
and to the and that to use information we must interpret it right and that our interferences and inferences in turn are based on assumptions and have implications all which involves ideas or concepts with some point of view man i know that was a mouthful right but when you think about what they're trying to get here they're trying to say is, is that the developing a good questioning attitude you have to develop that questioning mindset and it's kind of interesting because if you relate that back to the two documents that empo had written over in 2004 and then what eight nine years later they came out with another one evidently we must not have thought as clearly as we did or we lost sight of the original document in 2004 that someone came out and thought that they needed to freshen it up with that one that came out in 2012, 13, right? And so what I'm trying to get at is inevitably, sometimes the question really is the answer, right? Now, pro provided below, Elder and Paul discuss challenges to effective thinking, or otherwise what I would like to classify as challenges to a questioning attitude mindset as this is not something that comes easily. Notice they note, they said, and watch this. I thought that was an interesting statement they made. They said the human mind left to its own pursues that which is immediately easy, that which is comfortable, that which serves its self-interest. At the same time, it naturally resists that which is difficult to understand, that which involves complexity, that which requires entering the thinking and predicaments or predicaments of others. So what I'm trying to say is, is that the question attitude just doesn't happen easily, right? Even, I mean, we have our own human performance challenges in asking the question. Many times we find that if there's an easy way out, we'll take it instead of asking that hard question. Because again, sometimes there's resistance to that, right? The complexity involved in it, we're much happier taking that shortcut sometimes than it is on trying to sit there and spending time doing our homework and trying to find the answer. And that in many cases is what I see in these procedures, right? Sometimes I think it's easier to tell them to slowly open the valve. But when you ask the person why, why does that valve need to be opened slowly? Oh, well, because if you open it rapidly, it can cause a water hammer and a pipe, or we've had these relief valves lift. And said, so is there another way of doing it? I mean, is there another way of describing the word slow here? Well, there's a pressure gauge there. And really what we're looking for is that we want over like a 30 minute period, we want to see the pressure rise in like five pound increments. Then why didn't you say that? Because sometimes it's easier to say slow. But explain that to someone's family after the step that you wrote in that procedure just killed them. Don't think that can't happen to you. Matter of fact, someone is dying from a workplace accident here in the United States every 101 minutes. It's crazy to think that that's even possible in the, in the world and the technology we have today. Why is that? Because we're not asking those tough questions and it's got to stop. It's got to stop. Now, interestingly, if you look at the original principles of strong nuclear safety culture guidance that was developed in 2004. If you look at the previous slides, you will note then again, they published the next topic, MPO 12012, eight years later. Now, looking at the MPO operating experience database, I would say that MPO is overdue for a reminder yet again. Now it's 2024, right? Because I'm seeing the same stuff over again. I can't begin to tell you how many people that are writers, that are on projects, they say, Steve, you won't believe what I'm saying at these things. Oh, they're not following the, impo or they're not following the PPA or impo guidance here with this stuff. 
they're doing their own thing, whatever else. And here it is, the PPA standard for writing human factor procedures was published over 20 years ago. But yet we're still having these problems with these procedures, right? And it's getting worse now because the people who wrote these original procedures are retiring. And now it's the people that are doing it. I had one customer down in Carlisle, Louisiana, that missed one step in a procedure and it cost them $50 million in damage. And the only reason it didn't kill seven people was because they were in turnover in a hurricane-proof building when the explosion occurred, right? When I walk through the wreckage out there in the plant with the plant manager, his comment to me says, Steve, our biggest problem here today, as you can see from this, is that the new we, we've had, we have 170 staff, we have over 100 new people in the last three years, and the new people are trying to use our procedures. Now, what does that say? What does that say? Now, as I go through this, have you ever heard someone, and I it used to drive me crazy when I would hear it, but it says, you know, my spider senses are tingling, right? Have you ever heard that comment? And it's, you know, and so I actually looked it up. I Googled it and it looked at the spidey sense. Anybody ever hear you say something about this spidey sense? And, and the term uh, popularized, of course, by the um, web sling and superhero uh, is similar to what they call the sixth sense, that extra sensory perception, that gut feeling or the intuition that many of us have. You know, that feeling that you just feel uneasy about something and you're trying to figure out, man, I have no, you ever talk to yourself sometimes? You say, man, I don't know why I feel so uncomfortable with this, right? I mean, I've done this a dozen times before, but why am I, why today do I just don't feel that this is right? Now, it says essentially that spidey sense meaning boils down to this. It's a strong feeling of intuition, guiding you towards an advantageous, an advantageous choice or alerting you to a potential roadblock ahead, right? And the website I have up there on the screen is where all this came from, right? Now, interestingly, research shows that those who tapped into their intuition made better decisions. One such study found that participants who trusted their gut instincts made faster and more accurate choices compared to those who relied solely on analysis. Ever hear of that? Some people having that problem with analysis paralysis, right? Another study showed that those who followed their hunches tend to experience greater happiness. Now, can you really develop a spidey sense? Um, and they say that this is built, this is a built-in safety feature to us, helping you to avoid bad situations or noticing opportunities that feel right. Learning to recognize these subtle nudges is key to unlocking that power of your intuition. And I'm tying this all back to this questioning attitude. You know, it's like when you read a step in some document and say, you know, I, I just don't think the step is right. Well, Steve McCord, it says right here in the tech manual, in the vendor manual, right here is what it says. But does this make sense to you? You know, I think we ought to call the vendor on this. This this vendor document has been around for like three or four years. Let's call the vendor on this. I, I don't I don't understand this, you know. And so I mean, I've seen that happen many times, right? Now, here it says, you know, there's eight ways that you can hone your intuitiveness powers, right? So it says, play the I wonder game. Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci was fascinating for many reasons, but did you know that he is also used, used to tell his students that you should wonder 100 things out loud every single day. Wondering invites your intuition to come out and play. It moves your brain from thinking mode into the wondering mode. When you wonder, you open yourself up to being more curious and intuitive. It creates space for new thoughts and ideas to follow. I'm reading, there's actually a book here. There's a book, this one is called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. You know that um, when you think about uh, the most um, uh, brilliant people 
in the world over time and over time that he was rated the number one person. Like, you know, I always related him as being the, you know, the painter for the Mona Lisa and stuff. But did you know that when they talk about the most intelligent people on earth ever, that he was rated the number one person for his intelligence? He had this incredible mind that would just question things, you know, like, why did that apple fall off the tree? Like, well, that was Newton, of course, right? But like, you know, he, if you look at the detail in his paintings, he would take it to the, he, he would just agonize over the asking questions to try to make sure that he could capture it just right on what it was. I thought that was pretty interesting, right? That was number one. Number two, intuition inducing affirmations. He said, now affirmations are statements intended to build and maintain a healthy self-esteem, right? And to help foster a more positive outlook in life, right? Now they say the positive psychology practice or self-affirmation aims to help people combat the negative beliefs and restore trust in themselves, right? Now, or simply like themselves again. Typically, self-affirmation is accomplished by a way of short, positive statements repeated to oneself, uh, whether aloud or not, on a regular basis. Ideally, this is another way of looking at it, right? There's many times that questions don't get asked because we don't have the confidence in ourselves to say, uh, I just don't, I, I can't be right. You know, we just don't have that self-confidence ourselves, or we don't have that, that, that positive outlook on ourselves. And so you tend to take the back seat here when there could be this vital question that you have that can make a difference between a success and failure. And sometimes success and failure is different between life and death, equipment damage, uh, being on the six o'clock news or the 24 hour news, right? And so what they're trying to say is sometimes, you know, you gotta, you gotta have more confidence in yourself and to do that, sometimes you gotta basically try to have that positive outlook on yourself. Number three, now this is kind of interesting, spend time alone. Now we live in a world riddled with overstimulation, information and disinformation, overload, other people's energies and opinions, the media, right? With all this noise, it's difficult to distinguish between your inner voice and the cornucopia of outer voices shouting around you, right? I mean, how many times have you been, and I mean, I can't even watch the news anymore today, right? Because I mean, how many times have you'll sit there and it, it just makes you have this uneasy feeling the more you watch it, right? And and it, it's and it it can really affect your 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 um your positive feeling of yourself, uh, you know the work you're performing because you're just fixated on the bad stuff. The bad stuff just overcomes all the good with things, right? Now they say you know for at least thirty minutes a day without distraction, sounds or even a book. And I I'm like you know good luck with trying to do this and find time to do it yourself. But, you know, I, I, I wrote this down because I, I saw where the website mentioned this. And I was like, you know, boy, if I could do that, I bet you it would make a difference. You know, I mean, it's just you with yourself, letting your thoughts flow and listening to your, your inner self, right? I mean, you can journal your thoughts during this time or simply meditate, pray, whichever helps to get a better sense of that natural you, right? Ch try, trying to clear your mind of all the garbage that gets shoved into it every single day, right? Try to get to that spot so that when you do review a procedure or you do look at some instructions in there, it's not, it's not the, uh, and that should be your primary focus because it's a tool there to help support successful work performed by somebody, not a collateral job that, you know, is one of those multi-hat things you got to do. It's something that we should do that we need to have that clear mind, right? Many times when we're focused on on the work that we perform, right? They, they, they Impo got laughed at for this years ago where we talk about this mindset, right? They said, hey, you know, you want to put your phone on the airplane mode, take the phone off the hook, you know, clear out your calendar, get a focused attention on it. How many times have you been focused on something and then all of a sudden you have a meeting go to or someone from your family calls you 
you're on the phone for like 15 minutes and you feel like you just lost four hours worth of work. And, and that happens to us a lot, right? Well, this is kind of what this is saying to us. We're looking at those things from the aspect that when, you, when you're working on something, you create that forward vision. And for whatever you're working at this moment, for this to look good, you got to have that vision out here so that you can say that I'm constantly approaching to get to that vision. These things make sense to me, right? But now all of a sudden that distraction comes in and what happens? That forward look collapses. Now you're focused on whatever the issue is right now. How many times have you come back to it hours later and you're looking at where you left off and you're like, I don't even know why I wrote that. It doesn't even make any sense. I'm so glad I, I'm, I'm glad I had the break because that's horrible, you know? And you got to reinvent that forward look to be able to do that. So sometimes this 30 minutes of just having that peaceful thing can reset that clock on yourself and um you can do uh you can do well with that right i thought this was kind of funny they said hey flip a coin here's a fun trick to access uh, access your intuition when faced with a decision flip a coin heads or tails it doesn't matter the key here is to pay attention to your immediate gut reaction as the coin flips in the air so is that coin's flipping on the air what do you think it's going to be right are you secretly hoping for a specific outcome that initial reaction could be your intuition whispering its preference. Of course, don't blindly, don't blindly follow the coin. Use it as springboard for further reflection and tap into that underlying reasons for your gut feeling. Number five, capture your ah aha moments, right? Ever notice how you get your best ideas at some most random times? That's because intuition strikes when you get out of your own way. It comes quickly, spontaneous bursts of aha moments, right? Here's the catch. If you don't capture them, you'll tend to lose them. So for this reason, it's essential that you keep a little notebook physically or perhaps notes app on your phone. Write it down. Write down those bursts and those insights. You'll notice rather quickly that the, your spidey, spidey senses will become more fine-tuned and begin uh, rewarding you with more aha moments, right? Number six. Live in the now. Almost all the time, we have one foot anticipating the future and one foot dwelling on the past, leaving us practically disregarding the present. This is a sad case for many reasons. Mainly the present is all we have. However, the case is the, 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 case is the same when it comes into tapping into your intuition. It can only honestly speak to you if you're in the present, right? Alas, your higher self, your truest self, your spidey sense self has no concept on earthly time. It's only alive in the now. It becomes difficult for your intuition to speak to you if your mindset is always on your past. So be here, be in the now. Number seven, train your brainwaves. Explore centering, right? Now, this uh, this was on a website. This is not something that Steve McCord does on a general thing, but I would tell you it makes sense to me. Centering is an ancient uh, visualization technique that's popular in Aikido, the Japanese defense martial art of spiritual harmony, right? It teaches you to focus on here and now, taking power away from the outside concerns and negative thoughts and helping you to remain stable and grounded. Energy is lost when you're tense or stressed but centering redirects negative energy in a beneficial way. I had one of my staff recently that had some a very big challenging time with one of her parents, right? One of the things I, I, I mentioned to her that I, I was been, someone helped me myself years ago was, it says, you know, sometimes we got to think of ourselves as like a little nine volt battery, right? Worry is nothing but a drain on that battery at a time when you need all the energy and battery power possible to try to overcome whatever the major obstacle or major issue is that's affecting you in your life right now. You need all the battery power you can muster. But if you drain that battery, you drain yourself based on the fear of the unknown. Focus on what you know. Know that. And then when you know what you know, then 
you'll be in better shape to make the hard decisions that can have life altering changes for you, whether it's health and cancer or call all kinds of things, right? That can challenge all of us. The idea here is, is that make sure that you stay strong. Do not let the fear drain you. And that's what this is really trying to say, right? Think back to a time when you feel stressed or afraid. What physical reactions did you experience? Tense muscles, rapid breathing, sweaty palms, racing heart. All are common reactions to stress. Centering uses your mind to redirect this energy to the center of your body, giving you a sense of inner calm, right? Me, I pray. And it's different for everybody. But I would tell you is that I find that is my, my centering. I'll sit there and I'll take my 30 minutes to sit there and do that. And it really does clear my mind. So it, it, whatever works successfully for you, of course, right? But this is, I, I think this is, a, this is really true. And I can see with people that are, are um, into martial arts and things of that nature, I've, I've heard of this, you know, as being the, their source of their strength. And I can see where that comes from. So in conclusion, as noted by John Maxwell, I think the more questions you ask, the more valuable you will recognize them to be. As he stated, if you want to be successful and reach your leadership potential, right, whether it's leadership or whatever work that you're performing, you must embrace asking questions as a lifestyle. Here's why. Again, you only get the answers to the questions you ask. You, the questions unlock the doors and otherwise that remain closed. Questions are most effective means of connecting with people, cultivating humility, engaging others in conversation, building better ideas, offering a different perspective and challenging mindsets. So in conclusion, I think that in many cases, the question is the answer. You just can't be afraid to ask it. Open up any questions or whatever else and uh, any feedback on things. And I, I hope that helped a little bit, right? But we got to ask better questions. I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. And the work that comes across our desks. Sarah, is any questions from anybody? Not seeing any so far. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you for participating in this lunch and learn. I hope this uh, was uh, worthwhile having during a lunch. And again, um, think about those questions that you need to ask. Really hope that this helped and at least, at least kind of gave you some insight to, uh, to where we got to do a better job with this. Thanks, guys, for, for participating here. I really do appreciate your time.